if you look around uh, at a lot of menus at bars and restaurants, like it's hard not to find nachos on menus. Um, and that's because they're delicious. And um, I think everyone has like sort of a soft spot for them somewhere. So I've created a little presentation about them. Uh, let's see if I could do this right. There we go. Okay, so does that all look good? Everyone can see the, okay, good, thumbs up. Um, okay, so I love nachos and I'm guessing you do too, because I don't know why you would want to join a, a talk a chat on um, at the library to listen to nachos. Um, but if you're not a fan, I hope that we can um, try to make you at least proud of this dish, because it's a really interesting, has a really interesting history and background, and uh, there's actually a lot of different um, ways people are using it and, and sort of making it their own. Um, usually when I'm sort of trying to decide to look at a dish, I, uh, I head out into Chicago and I try to find the best versions of it that I can. Um, it didn't go well at first. Um, this plate right here is one of the worst dishes I've ever had while eating out in Chicago. This is at the Signature Lounge, um, which is that uh, the bar on the top of the, the Hancock Center. Um, I don't think it's called the Hancock Center anymore, but um, as you can see, everything about this is really bad. The chips are broken. The, they use ground duck um, on it for some reason. The cheddar is sort of melted, but not really. They decided to add pesto, which doesn't make any sense at all, I think, to make it sound fancy. And then they have these big hunks of jalapeno. So you either have no jalapeno or way too much. Um, and it's over $20, which is insane. So these are, I think, why people have such a bad opinion of nachos is because you'll occasionally run into a dish that looks like this. Um, fortunately, these are the worst that I tried, and it gets a lot better. Um, but as I was researching it, usually, so nachos are actually, were actually invented in Mexico. So usually when I'm trying, when I find a dish that's Mexican, I try to go to neighborhoods in Chicago that have a lot of Mexican immigrants to see how it is there. Um, I went to a place called Gordillas in Little Village, and they're best known for, this is not nachos, this is a burrito. This is a burrito from Gordillas, it's a barbacoa. So this is my favorite burrito in Chicago. And as you can tell, it's a very slender, thin rolled burrito. It only has refried beans and meat inside of it. Um, and it's a handmade flour tortilla. They make it fresh to order. I thought this is gonna be a perfect place to go find nachos. Um, and then this is what they served. And as you can see, it has a whole bunch of cheese that's not melted, which I think is a sin against nachos. And so I realized after going to a few other um, sort of traditional Mexican restaurants in Little Village and Pilsen that I wasn't at the place I needed to be. Um, and so that's when I decided, oh, I also found one at, this is Tacos um, Tequilas in Logan Square. You'll find a lot of nachos on menus and, uh, you can sort of tell that they care about other things more than the nachos. So at Tacos Tequilas, they have these amazing tacos, um, especially their potato and um, epazote tacos are my favorite. Um, but these are just kind of like they just threw a bunch of stuff on chips and there's nothing wrong with it, but um, it wasn't very inspiring. So instead, we need to look back at the history of nachos to try to get a better sense of what they are. So this is the man that they think invented nachos. His name is Ignacio Anaya. Um, and Ignacio is... Um, in Mexico, sort of a nickname for Ignacio would be Nacho. So one night at the Victory Club in Piedras Negras, Mexico, which is just right across the border um, from the U.S., um, a group of women came in, a group of American women came in, and they drank a lot of margaritas, or actually not margaritas, there was a different cocktail 
that had um, blackberry liqueur in it, I'm blanking on the name right now. Anyway, let's just say they had a few. And so he needed to, they needed to get some food in them to, you know, properly survive but all his cooks had gone home. So he put together some uh, tortilla chips, put some cheese on, put pickle jalapenos on them, and then put it under the broiler and then sent them out. And he called them nachos specials um, or nachos especiales. Um, that was shortened then to nachos. And he sort of was the first to popularize this dish. Um, so the original nachos, just for everyone, are just the tortilla chip, um, melted cheese, and a pickled jalapeno slice. Um, as you can see, they're very simple. And, uh, you know, almost no nachos today look like this. But it's a good to get a sense of, like, how the, the dish started before we move on too quickly. Um, but the man who probably popularized nachos across the country was Howard Cosell, who um, you might realize was a sportscaster. Um, one night on Monday Night Football, between a game of the Baltimore Colts and the Dallas Cowboys, he tried nachos <coughs> and loved them so much that he started talking about how great they were on air um, and uh, that sort of threw the name of nachos out into the world. And so soon you started seeing them all across the country and especially at um, sporting events. The thing is, is that the nachos that he tried looked like this. These are what we all know lovingly as ballpark nachos. Um, as you can see, the, the cheese, everything has been separated. So we have chips, we have cheese and a little container and then just <laughs> um, jalapeno slices just sort of strewn across the top, you know, with not a lot of love there. Um, what this is, is actually invented by Frank um, Liberto. He, entered, he came up with a formula for the molten nacho cheese. The first game he first introduced them was at the, in 1976 at a Texas Rangers baseball game in Arlington, Texas. And this really was the, the, the point where nachos went from a sort of regional curiosity to becoming extremely popular. Now, why did liquid, liquid nacho cheese catch on? Um, well, it's cheap, it doesn't need to be refrigerated, it stays liquid even when cool, and it has a long shelf life. So um, you could be a vendor at a, a baseball game or a football game and you know, not have to worry about you know, worrying about the cheese going bad or anything, and as a spectator, um, you can take the chips back to your, uh, to the nachos back to your seat and not worry about the cheese getting so stiff that it would seize up and then you wouldn't be able to dip it and all this kind of stuff. Um, of course, the thing about liquid cheese is it's not especially flavorful, um, but it is remarkably uh, interesting as a food stuff. Uh, it does have a sort of viscosity that is unreplaceable. Um, but yeah, so this is, so when we go back, this is the nachos that sort of swept around the country. Um, he, um, Frank was also developed the nacho cheese pump, which is very important. So uh, this way, not only could you put the cheese in your designated cheese cup holding area, but you could also then drizzle it all over the chips if you wanted to, or onto many other items if that's what you decide to do to yourself. Um, and uh, he also developed um, a huge marketing campaign for Rico's. Uh, so he really was the sort of like the salesman behind nachos. So he was able to get the product out there to as many places as possible and really try to get people to try it because it was considered a sort of Tex-Mex um, regional item, uh, you know, jalapenos weren't especially popular in the north at that time, especially pickled jalapenos. So this was a way to sort of um, 
it was easy to package up chips and this cheese that never went bad, which wasn't actually cheese. It's actually called a cheese product or a cheese sauce because um, it can't technically be called cheese because um, there's so little of it actually in there. Um, but then, yeah. So it, that's where I, uh, the history took me. So it then got me thinking of, you know, what, what is it about nachos? When do we usually eat them? And for the most part, it seems to be at drinking establishments um, where lots of beer is available or cocktails or something. Um, so if you had a baseball game, you have your big beer and you're eating nachos, they're very salty, then you want to drink your beer and all this stuff. So as I was looking for nachos around Chicago, I realized I ne really needed to focus on bars. And um, so that left me actually up to the north side. Um, so one of my favorites was that the Broken Barrel Bar. This is Chef Brian Anderson. Um, I just found out a few days ago that he actually left and is starting a, a position somewhere else, but uh, look out for him. He's a good chef. So he loves nachos, and the one that he created for Broken Barrel Bar are fascinating chips. Um, so here's a close-up picture of them. Uh, so they are not simple at all. They, as you can see, um, start with freshly fried tortilla chips. So what he does is he buys um, tortillas from El Milagro, which is a tortilleria in Chicago. Uh, but if you would just go to the store and buy El Milagro tortillas, they would kind of fry up and they would puff in the middle because they have a lot of moisture in them. So El Milagro developed a tortilla that had less moisture and would be able to fry really crisp and quickly. So it's thinner and is drier. So those are the chips that, he, those are the tortillas he buys. He cuts them up and fries them to order for the nachos. Then instead of a nacho cheese sauce, um, he makes a smoked jalapeno cheddar sauce, which he's very proud of. Um, and then he uses both pickled onions and pickled jalapenos, uh, fresh radish for crunch. Then he adds crispy Brussels sprouts. Um, and he told me he added Brussels sprouts because everything else on the menu was so unhealthy that he felt like he needed to have some vegetables somewhere. Um, not that nachos are ever considered healthy, but if you add Brussels sprouts, maybe you feel a little better about yourself. Then there's uh, roasted salsa um, and um, a little bit of sour cream and then um, cilantro. I'm not sure why it calls it micro cilantro, but anyway, these are uh, wonderful and they're great for watching at, again, at the Broken Barrel Bar whenever we can ever go back to that life. Um, but that led to other kinds of nachos that I was able to find around um, the city. So one kind of nacho that you're going to see a lot around is uh, barbecue nachos. So this is where you take, um, where you top cheese or top the chips with um, kind of some kind of smoked meat and then um, barbecue sauce instead of salsa. But as you can see here, the, the platter also has um, sort of a liquid cheese and then there's also um, pickled jalapenos. Um, so that even though it is barbecue, it still has some of the fundamentals of what made nachos nachos in the first place. Um, another one I was surprised that I liked so much was at Ditka's. Um, and uh, what he does is you can see each one of these chips is its own thing. They're not stacked on top of each other. Um, this actually goes back to how nachos started. Um, at the, uh, with uh, Ignacio, he didn't make a big stack of chips. He individually put stuff on each one. Um, and at Ditka's, he, um, they put a pot roast on it, which sounds sort of sacrilegious, but you know, it's a really tasty braised beef that you put on and then he covers it with cheese and as you can see, more pickled jalapenos. Um, and a lot of people like to drink at Ditka's, so the nachos are very popular. Um, but there were some really interesting sort of advancements, if you want to call that, in the, in the nacho game. So one of my favorite bars is uh, the Half Acre Lincoln Tap Room. And uh, so their nachos, 
um, start with freshly fried chips and then what they call science cheese, which is they take a cheese and then they add um, some uh, chemicals that sounds bad, but sort of a molecular gastronomy. If you're thinking of like sort of fancy restaurants, they use sort of powders to help bind sauces together. And that's what they've done here with the cheese. So they call it science cheese and it has the, the, the texture that you would love from the ballpark nacho cheese, but it has so much more flavor. And another thing that they do really well here is once again, they use um, both pickled jalapenos and pickled red onions, um, as I'll get to later. I don't think you can have too many pickled things on nachos. I don't think it's possible. Um, and then I was also kind of surprised uh, at the nachos at Upton's. Um, so if you think about nacho cheese, the, the nacho cheese sauce from the ballparks, it's not the most natural substance. So um, it, what Upton's did is they've created a vegan version of that cheese that is actually really flavorful. Um, so this whole plate in front of you is vegan. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the, um, the seitan chorizo, but it's, it's harmless. But I was really impressed with the cheese. But that shows you that there's um, the people in restaurants in Chicago were thinking about nachos in all different kinds of ways. Um, of course, we can't go to any of these restaurants right now um, because of the pandemic. And um, never, you can order them out, but I uh, would suggest, highly suggest against ordering nachos for delivery because um, they don't hold up the cheese. Uh, you know, gets gooey and weird, and then the, the chips steam, and then they get soft, and then the whole thing just collapses, and then, then you're basically eating nachos with a fork, which is never a good idea. So I've been really focusing on how to make nachos at home, and um, if you go back to the original nacho, when it just starts with the, with the, the three C's, which I did this slideshow wrong, it should be chips, cheese, and then pickled jalapeno chilies, uh, which are with C's. Uh, though this is sort of the foundation of nachos. I don't think that, um, I think that you can add all kinds of crazy things to nachos if you want to. Um, I'm not a traditionalist at all. I don't mind if it's pot roast or roasted Brussels sprouts. Anything can work as long as it tastes really good. Um, but I really do think and believe in the sort of foundation of a really good tortilla chip, um, a little bit of gooey cheese, and then um, the pickled jalapeno chilies on top. So when we talk about tortilla chips, as I mentioned before, um, it's really easy to make tortilla chips at home if, if you get the right tortillas. Um, and uh, you can fry them yourself, or um, but you, you can buy, um, buy chips that are really good in the stores. Um, and when we make nachos, I think it's important to spread them out on a sheet pan. Um, so these are sort of touching, but it, that's fine. But what you don't want is when you're making nachos to sort of pile them all up so that they, so that when you put the toppings on, they don't all have toppings. That's one of the saddest things is when you get a tortilla chip, a nacho tortilla chip and it doesn't have anything on it. That's, that makes me sad. So. Anyway, when you make nachos at home, start with this. So my favorite um, local sort of tortilla chip is made by El Milagro. And um, these are both uh, really tasty and um, kind of thick, so they won't collapse. So if you go with a, with a chip that's too thin, um, you're, you know, you'll pick the chip up and then it'll crack and then all the stuff will stay down there and you'll be left with the end of it in your hand and that's sad. Um, another good option is uh, Rick Bayless's Frontera chips. Those are, um, those are really good. Um, I would avoid uh, uh, Tostitos. Those are extremely salty and um, are easy to break, but you know, whatever works for you is totally fine. So when it comes to cheese, the sort of traditional, um, nachos were made with a cheese called longhorn style cheddar, which is not something that's especially popular here. Um, it's made 
it was originally made in Wisconsin, as a lot of cheese was, but then sort of very popular in Texas. And for the life of me, I can't really decide what makes it that much different than um, other mild forms of cheddar or Colby, except for that it sort of has a half circle shape in the, in the packaging. Um, I've done a lot of research on this and um, I was able to find the brand that you see on the right side, um, also called Queso de Papa, um, at one of my local Mexican markets, uh, Carniceria Jimenez. Um, and it is a, is a really wonderful nacho cheese, but don't stress out if you can't find this kind, because what distinguishes Longhorn style is uh, it's just sort of a very mild cheddar, and it melts really well, and it doesn't get stringy when it melts, and it doesn't uh, get hard. If you go for a too hard uh, or an aged cheddar, what will happen when it melts is it'll, the grease will separate, and you'll be left with splotches of, of grease and then hard pieces of cheese, and it really doesn't work. That sort of what happened at the uh, the signature lounge when they tried to use a fancy aged cheddar. It just doesn't, you know, sort of embrace the mild cheddar because um, I think it really works. And then um, I really do think people underestimate the importance of the pickled jalapeno. Um, I make sure every single chip has a, a single slice of the jalapeno. Um, it doesn't have to be a big one. It can be a very thin slice. It can be just a little half a slice, but you really want that, both the heat and the acidity that you get from pickled jalapenos. Because you're talking about fried chips and melted cheese. So these are really heavy. So you want something to kind of cut through that. And um, the pickled jalapeno does that really well. Um, and then from then on, it really is up to you. So there's a lot of really good additions that you can do to nachos. And there's some I'm sure I haven't even thought of before, um, but there's some things to sort of consider. Um, I think cooked salsas work really well, um, whether those are tomatillo salsas or tomato salsas. Um, uh, guacamole is another way to add uh, creaminess. So if you don't want to add as much cheese to the nachos, adding um, either guacamole or refried beans is a great way to sort of um, or to have the creaminess of nachos that you want, but uh, without sort of the excess amount of cheese. Um, uh, like I said, pickled onions is a fantastic addition. Um, cilantro adds freshness. Um, and then when you get to meat, um, you really can't go wrong unless you try to make it too big. So things need to be uh, sort of easy to eat. And um, so braised meats or crumbled chorizo or chili. Um, and honestly, a little sour cream is okay. Um, what doesn't work, I don't think, is uh, watery salsas, and, um, which is a lot of fresh salsas like pico de gallo. If you do use that, make sure you drain some of the water out because um, sort of moisture is the enemy of nachos because then it'll sort of weaken the chip and then it'll collapse and then everything's terrible. Um, shredded lettuce, I don't know why anyone would add shredded lettuce, but a lot of places do. Um, it's just watery and um, it'll like waterlogged chips. Canned olives, I don't like canned olives, so I don't know why people do that. Um, too much sour cream. Uh, pesto, going back to the Signature Lounge, I don't know what was going on there. Um, and then large pieces of meat, because then that's just not fair. Because then either somebody gets the whole piece of meat or, uh, you know, gets nothing. Um, and so, as I was studying all of this, I realized that there's the sort of world of nachos. People are starting to call things nachos that can be questionable in there. Um, so we have Irish nachos, which are thinly sliced and fried potatoes, um, almost like cottage fries. Um, and then they're topped with cheese and stuff. Um, and then uh, we get back, and then Ohio nachos are potato chips. Tater, tachos are tater tots. You're seeing this everywhere now. Tachos are really popular. Um, and then other alternatives I've seen are pita chips, wontons, grilled vegetables. Um, I've seen people try to make nachos with lettuce, apples, and avocado halves. Um, 
these are all terrible ideas. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm sure some, I've seen wontons worked okay, um, but I don't, I mean, basically anything with cheese and salsa is going to taste pretty good, but for my money, I think, I'm not, a, I don't try not to be too strict about definitions, but um, I really think a tortilla chip is the foundation of it all, and when you start moving to these other things, it just doesn't work as well. Um, the, the fried potatoes get soggy. Potato chips crack in half. Um, tater tots just soak up everything <laughs> and turn to mush after a few seconds. Um, but you know, if that's your thing, that's that's totally fine. I'm not against it. Uh, so there so, are a couple of questions in the chat. I don't know if oh, you wanted to yeah, answer let's them. Get, now. Let's get to some of those questions now. Um, so we had two questions from. Steve and one question from Anna. Um, so Steve's first question was, so assuming we add shredded cheese to the top of the chips, do I need to also open a can of melted queso? And with these additions, do you also meticulously apply a bit so that each chip gets a bit? This, these are great. These are great questions. Okay, so let's go, um, let's go back. So here we have the chips. Um, I, I did a lot of research to see how much cheese needs to go on each individual chip. And um, I, I'm sort of between the five and 10 gram area, um, which is an insane thing to talk about out loud. But if you want to weigh out each thing, but usually it's just sort of like a, a finger amount of uh, a pinch of cheese. Um, so what you want to do is get all of your cheese shredded um, and by the way, you, you can buy shredded, pre-shredded cheese, but uh, it has uh, stabilizers in it and um, it affects how it, how it melts. And I don't think it, it works as well as just grating a, a block of cheese. And it's not that hard. So you'll take the cheese and put uh, um, five grams <laughs> to 10 grams, depending on how you feel, on e every single chip. And this sounds crazy, I know, but if you're going to do nachos, you might as well try to do them right. And this way, you're guaranteed that every single nacho has cheese on it. Um, at, at that point, I then add the slice of pickled jalapeno to every single chip. And then we start thinking about other things. When I was starting this, I really thought that... Um, I didn't know if you, I didn't know if I liked any of the melted cheeses because I just felt like nacho cheese is very bland and uh, a lot of the other cheeses that, um, melted cheeses, you're just diluting the flavor of cheese when you mix it with milk or anything else. Um, but I um, was convinced by a number of places that I went to in Chicago um, especially a place called Little Goat Diner, their, uh, their nachos had both cheese and queso on them, or a melted cheese, um, and it, they were terrific. They were outstanding. So that is a really great thing that you can do, is adding two kinds of cheese, one that's the shredded kind, and then the other is the uh, sort of more liquidy ballpark cheese that we're all, we're all used to. Um, so was that, it, what was the other part of the question? Uh, so he also asks, um, you know, with these additions, do you also meticulously apply a bit so that each chip gets a bit? I think you answered that, yeah. that yes, indeed, it is very important to pay equal attention to each chip, give them yeah. the tender loving care they deserve. Correct. Um, <laughs> I, the other questions were, where do you get pickled jalapeno? And also, uh, this time from Steve again, um, I also find it difficult to separate the chips from the baking sheet when the cheese has melted, thus making an impressive mound difficult. Any tricks for a good transfer from baking sheet to serving vessel? Um, okay. Or, yeah. Okay. So, um, one of the things is if you if you just took the shredded cheese and just sort of dumped it all over the tray, um, as you can see on the tray, the cheese would fall on the tray and then it would stick and then that's what he's sort of talking about. 
So individually putting the cheese on each chip helps prevent the sticky issues that he's uh, discussing. Um, one thing you can also do is just put a, a sheet of aluminum foil down. Um, that makes it easier to uh, clean up. Um, as far as serving, I think it's really actually really wonderful to just serve it in the tray. Um, to actually bring it, if you're sitting at a table, you just bring the whole tray right there. And so they're all dressed, ready to go. Um, another thing I did is uh, in the Tribune article I wrote, um, I talked about uh, I, about making all the nachos just the um, straightforward chips, cheese, and chilies, and then having all the sides um, on the side. So then you could take a few chips at a time and dress them up as you as you personally saw fit. So you could add sour cream or guacamole or another kind of salsa, but you could do that at the table instead of trying to individually um, top all of the chips with all of the ingredients.